In the 60s of the last century, residents of American megacities repeatedly appealed to the city administration with complaints about strange phenomena occurring in the sky. In completely cloudless weather, thunder would suddenly sound in the sky and, rapidly subsiding, disappear without a trace. Time passed. The mysterious thunder continued to periodically frighten ordinary Americans. Finally, on July 10, 1967, after sporadic complaints turned into mass discontent, the U.S. Air Force made an official statement saying that the strange thunder appeared as a result of flights of the Lockheed SR-71 supersonic strategic reconnaissance aircraft. The story continued with several dozen lawsuits by American citizens, in which they demanded the Air Force to compensate for the damage caused by the flights. The amount that the military had to pay according to the court decision amounted to $35,000. However, in the 30-year history of the fastest and one of the most expensive in operation military aircraft SR-71, is a small drop in the sea of victories and defeats. The first flight of the Blackbird, or Blackbird, as the U.S. military nicknamed the SR-71 for its appearance, took place on December 22, 1964. The new supersonic reconnaissance aircraft was intended for use by the U.S. Air Force, which at that time had no worthy rival to the new generation A-12 supersonic reconnaissance aircraft in service with the CIA. At that time, the A-12 was the fastest aircraft in the world, about 3,300 kilometers slash H, and had one of the highest ceilings of maximum altitude, 28. Cinque kilometri. Initially, the CIA planned to use the A-12 for reconnaissance over the territory of the Soviet Union and Cuba, however, plans had to be changed due to the event that occurred on May 1, 1960, when the predecessor of the Titan Goose, as the A-12 was called, U-2 was shot down by a Soviet anti-aircraft missile system. The CIA decided not to risk expensive airplanes and use satellites for reconnaissance in the USSR and Cuba, and sent the A-12 to Japan and North Vietnam. He chief designer of the A-12, Clarence Kelly Johnson, felt that this distribution of reconnaissance forces was unfair and, beginning in 1958, he began to negotiate closely with the Air Force High Command on the development of a more advanced military aircraft that could combine the functions of a reconnaissance and bomber. Four years later, the U.S. Air Force finally evaluated the possible advantages it could gain from having the A-12 or a possible prototype in service and gave its approval. By then, Johnson and his crew had been working on two new models, the R-12 and RS-12, for over a year. A few months later, the mock-ups were ready and Johnson presented them to Air Force Command. General Lee May, who arrived at the presentation, was extremely dissatisfied. He said that the RS-12, no more than a repetition of the bomber designed at the time of North American Aviation XB-70 Valkyrie, a modification of the RS-70. Perhaps the reason for this statement were, first, the combat purpose of both aircraft, reconnaissance bombers, secondly, the ability to refuel in the air and the other model, and thirdly, the maximum speed, both of them three times the speed of sound. In all other respects, neither in size, shape, nor technical characteristics the airplanes are completely dissimilar. Johnson was unable to change General May's mind. Moreover, the dispute became so serious that you, S. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara had to intervene. Without taking sides, he simply ordered to stop the development of both aircraft. If Johnson had been replaced by someone else, then perhaps the projects would have remained just projects. However, about him quite rightly once said Hall Hibbard, Johnson's supervisor and head of the project to create the first aircraft, Stealth F-117. That damn Swede literally seized the air. Perhaps now Johnson saw the air better than before and therefore decided to use his last chance. He simply changed the RS acronym from Reconnaissance Strike to Reconnaissance Strategic. Thus, having changed the combat purpose of his airplane, no one could accuse him of duplicating the Valkyrie and he continued the development of the RS-12. He simply changed the RS acronym from Reconnaissance Strike to Reconnaissance Strategic. Thus, having changed the combat purpose of his airplane, no one could accuse him of duplicating the Valkyrie, and he continued the development of the RS-12. An SR-71 model RS-12 turned into SR-71 by accident. In his speech in July 1964, U.S. President Lyndon Johnson, 
Speaking of the RS-12 airplane, mixed up the letters and pronounced SR-12. By the way, it was not the only blunder of the president in speeches concerning airplanes. In February of the same year, Johnson read instead of the abbreviation AMI, Advanced Manned Interceptor, the name A-11, which also later became the official name. The Index 71 Clarence Johnson took as an indication that his scout model was the next step after the Valkyrie project. This is how the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird came to be. The most important difference and unrivaled to date advantage is the supersonic speed of the SR-71, 3,529 km per hour. This figure is three times the speed of sound in air. The A-12 and YF-12 were losing to the Blackbird by more than 200 km per hour. In this respect, Johnson's airplanes made a revolution. After all, the world's first supersonic airplane appeared in 1954, just eight years before the A-12 or SR-71. The maximum speed it could reach was barely above the speed of sound, 1,390 km per hour. In 1990, thanks to its speed, the Blackbirds avoided the usual conservation in museums and hangars of military bases, as NASA showed considerable interest in them, where several copies were transferred. The high speed not only solved the tasks set by Johnson, but also created many difficulties in the operation of the Blackbird. At a speed of Mach 3, Mach number equals one speed of sound, I, I, 1,390 km per hour, friction against the air was so great that the titanium skin of the aircraft heated up to 300 degrees Celsius. However, Johnson solved this problem as well. Minimal cooling was provided by the black paint of the hull, made on a ferrite base. Ferrite is iron or an iron alloy. It had a dual function. Firstly, it dissipated the heat coming to the surface of the airplane, and secondly, it reduced the radar visibility of the airplane. In order to reduce the visibility of ferrite paint, was very often used in military aviation. The main conditioner in the SR-71 design was special JP-7 fuel which was developed for the U.S. supersonic aviation. Thanks to its constant circulation from the fuel tanks, through the airplane's skin, to the engines, the Blackbird's body was constantly cooled, while the fuel had time to heat up to 320 degrees Celsius. However, the technical advantages of the JP-7 were little justified by its consumption. At cruising speed, the two engines of the Pratt Whitney J-58 Scout consumed about 600 kilograms per minute. On January 25, 1966, the first SR-71 crashed. The Scout was flying at an altitude of 24,390 meters at Mach 3, at which point the aircraft lost control due to an air intake control system failure. Pilot Bill Weaver successfully ejected despite the ejection seat remaining in the airplane. Johnson installed new ejection seats on the SR-71 that allowed pilots to safely leave the cockpit at an altitude of 30 meters and a speed of Mach 3. It may have been a fluke, he was simply thrown out of the cockpit by the air current. Weaver's partner Jim Sauer also managed to eject, but he did not survive. Bill Weaver did most of the testing of the Blackbird. It wasn't the only disaster for him, nor was it for his partners. On January 10, 1967, the SR-71 was undergoing high-speed runs on the runway. To make it more difficult, the runway had been wet beforehand to enhance the glide effect. Having landed on the runway at a speed of 370 km per hour, pilot Art Peterson was unable to release the brake parachute. It should be noted that the SR-71 has a runway departure speed of 400 km per hour. Of course, Conventional brakes could not stop the Scout on a wet surface and the SR-71 continued to move along the runway at the same speed. As soon as it entered the dry section of the track, all the tires of the landing gear burst from the high temperature. The bare landing gear discs began to shoot sparks, causing the magnesium alloy wheel bushings to catch fire. Considering that magnesium alloys ignite at temperatures between 400 degrees Celsius and 650 degrees Celsius, this was roughly the temperature in the landing gear area during braking. The airplane stopped only when it skidded across the runway and crashed nose down into the ground of a dried up lake. Peterson survived, however, suffering numerous burns. The failure of the brake parachute was an isolated incident, but the magnesium bushings repeatedly caused the Blackbird to catch fire. In the end, 
The engineers replaced the magnesium alloy with aluminum. In 1968 to 1969, three more SR-71 crashes occurred. The causes were failure of the electric generator, the battery, which could provide the airplane with 30 minutes of flight time, was not enough. Engine fire and fuel tank fire after debris from wheel discs punctured it. The airplanes failed and another serious drawback appeared on the surface of the project. Firstly, there was a catastrophic shortage of spare parts, and secondly, the repair of one airplane would have hit hard on the pocket of the U.S. Air Force. It is known that the cost of maintaining one squadron of S-R-71s was equal to the cost of keeping two wings of tactical fighters in flying condition. This is about $28 million. Those Blackbirds that successfully passed flight tests were subjected to the most rigorous technical inspections. After landing, each flying unit underwent about 650 checks. In particular, two technicians spent several hours on post-flight checks of air intakes, engines, and bypass devices. Lockheed suffered heavy losses, both technical and human, during the testing that took place until 1970, when the SR-71 had already been in service for four years. However, military service for the Blackbirds was just beginning. The SR-71's primary reconnaissance locations were Vietnam, North Korea, the Middle East, Cuba, and still, despite warnings from Air Force commanders, the Soviet Union near the Kola Peninsula. When the Blackbirds began being sent to North Vietnam in 1968, it was in the midst of the Vietnam War between the North and South of the country, 1955 to 1975. From 1965 to 1973, there was a period of full-scale U.S. military intervention. For the SR-71, this was the largest military assignment. The Blackbirds were fitted with their own reconnaissance equipment. They were equipped with an automatic autonomous astro-inertial navigation system, which was guided by the stars, allowing to calculate the location of the aircraft without error even during the day. A similar navigation system was later used in the Soviet T-4 rocket bomber under design at that time. The SR-71 could check the exact compliance of the flight with the specified route with the help of an air data calculator and an onboard computer. In the reconnaissance process itself, the SR-71 could use several aerial cameras, a side-scan radar system, radar, and infrared-capable equipment, thermal imaging devices. A panoramic aerial camera was also located in the forward instrument compartment. Such reconnaissance equipment allowed the Blackbird for one hour of flight at an altitude of 24 kilometers to survey the territory of 155,000 kilometers too. This is slightly less than half of the territory of modern Vietnam. As for purely photographic equipment, for one flight the scout shot several hundred ground objects. Thus, for example, in November 1970 in Vietnam, before the failed operation of the U.S. military falling rain to release prisoners from the Sun Tay camp, the Blackbird managed to photograph the place where the prisoners were supposedly held. At the end of the 80s, the first wave of the decision to remove the Blackbirds from the U.S. Air Force's inventory began. The reasons were numerous. A large number of crashes, high cost of operation, shortage and high cost of spare parts and, finally, vulnerability to Soviet weapons. In the fall of 1989, the final decision was made to remove the SR-71 from service. Opponents of this decision argued that there was no alternative to the SR-71 and spy satellites, which were advocated in Congress and in the Air Force themselves did not justify themselves either in price, which was several times higher than the cost of the Blackbirds, or in effectiveness, as the SR-71 could conduct more extensive reconnaissance. Almost all of the planes were handed over to museums, a few were left idle on bases, and a few were given to NASA and the Pentagon for use.